Okay, as we continue talking about end tidal CO2, uh, our electronic exhaled CO2 detectors may be qualitative and or quali uh, quantitative. So qualitative meaning they're going to either give us a yes or no answer. It's either going to be yes, there is uh, CO2 present or no, there is not. And quantitative is going to give us a number associated with that. Yes, it's going to tell us if CO2 is present, but it is also going to give us the number uh, that we are looking for. Um, the qualitative devices are by far are better. They are what we want uh, because they give us a, uh, we can look at it and judge our, our gas exchange uh, and what's going on with the, uh, more with our patient um, with that information. Um, exhale CO2 readings are monitored in both patients that are, who are intubated and not intubated. Um, the modern capnometers can display a number. They're going to give us that number, and they're also going to give a digital waveform, uh, like an EKG gives a wave uh, gives us a visual representation of the heart. This is going to give us a digital representation of the entire respiratory cycle, from inhalation uh, to exhalation, uh, for every breath. There are two major types of capnography. Uh, mainstream and side stream. Each has its advantages and disadvantages, uh, as with anything else. Um, with mainstream capnography, the infrared light is shown through gas uh, through the gas uh, within the patient circuit. So, this is the actual sensor is at the patient on the on the breathing circuit, as close to the patient as they can get, um, shining the light through uh, and getting its uh, readings at that point. Um, with side stream, a sample of the gas is aspirated from the uh, main gas flow circuit is taken through a sampling tube uh, to the monitor that is away from the patient. Um, the sample line is attached to the sensor unit uh, that is typically housed inside the monitor, like the LifePak 15 or the uh, Zoll M series or X series. Um, and the uh, so you, you have a, a little bit of a delay. So some of our uh, advantages to either or are uh, the mainstream capnography, the CO sensor is located directly between the ET tube and the breathing circuit. So it's as close to the patient as it could possibly get. And it measures the total uh, breath coming uh, or the total amount of CO2 coming out of that uh, or across its sensor. It provides real-time information because it's right there. It's more accurate uh, because it's taking a full, it's, it's sampling the entire gas that's passing uh, in front of it or across the sensors. There's no sampling line and is not affected by water vapor uh, or pressure changes. Whereas side stream, uh, it takes a sample of the gas uh, from a uh, through a sampling tube and analyzed in the analyzer that's away from the patient. So there's a distance there. Uh, so there's some dead space in that line that needs to be taken up and then uh, it's to the patient or to the sensor. Now, side stream capnography is uh, generally lightweight. It's it usually combined with another monitor that you're carrying with you anyway. They're less expensive. They can be used in non-intubated patients, including with CPAP by use of either the nasal cannula or the site or the uh, ET tube adapter. Uh, it's easy to connect. It's just a simple slip in place and twist into your monitor. Uh, the uh, tubing is disposable. Uh, can be used with a simultaneous oxygen administration and the calibration is automatic. So th that's quite a few advantages. So as we Progress, we're also going to look at the disadvantages, which include uh, the mainstream catnography is bulky and the sensor is pretty heavy. They're generally found in hospitals. Um, they can be used in intubated patients only. So that sensor only fits on that uh, adapter between the ET tube and the vent uh, circuit. And there's no other way of uh, measuring for uh, any other patient that's not intubated. The probe is expensive because the sensor is right there in that probe. So when that probe is, it is disposable because it's a, you can't use on multiple patients. Uh, so it gets thrown away. So you have to replace that sensor every single time. And they also require calibration. 
side stream, a uh, small sampling tube is easily obstructed by example would be water vapor, vomitus, blood, anything else that can get in the tube, mucus. Um, they are slightly less expensive or slightly less accurate. I apologize. Slightly less accurate uh, due to that dead space. So as it says here a little bit, uh, is there's a delay. There could be a delay of several seconds in analyzing of the sample. Um, because of that dead space, it's got to clear out. You generally, uh, when you hook these up, you hear the pump, and it's the sampling pump that's pulling that sample of uh, gas from the mainstream and down into the sensor. Water vapor can, uh, can affect uh, the sensor in the, uh, in the monitor if it gets that far. Um, generally they have a little, there's a little filter in line in the, in the uh, sampling line or something in the way that would uh, hopefully uh, prevents that. Uh, pressure drop along the sampling tube may affect entitled CO2 readings. Um, because it's not getting the same flow if there's uh, any kind of pressure drop for whatever reason. So here is an example of a side stream uh, entitled CO2 monitoring adapter. And there's the sampling tube that goes to the monitor. And that's the piece between the ET tube adapter and the bag valve mask. And that would be the same as if there was a ventilatory circuit there. The capno reflects, or the capnogram reflects exhaled CO2 concentrations over time. And that time is broken up into four phases. And I'm going to describe them to you as I can't show you. I tried to draw on here earlier and it doesn't work uh, for whatever reason until I get that figured out. Um, but you can easily look this up as well. So phase one is the respiratory baseline. That's where that will be your, uh, is the flat at the base of the, of the graph um, when no CO2 is present and corresponds to late phase of inspiration and the early part of inspiration, which is where that dead space is being uh, ventilated. So there's no gas exchange in the dead space so there won't be any CO2 in there. There should not be any CO2 in there. And then phase two and this is the respiratory upstroke. This reflects the appearance of CO2 in the alveoli. So where you would think that the upswing would be your inhalation, it actually is not because it's measuring the increase in CO2. So that's your exhalation, that's your expiratory phase. So two, you're gonna see the upswing uh, as the CO2 increases, uh, reflects the appearance of CO2 into the alveoli. And th three is where it uh, levels out, uh, it's called the respiratory plateau, and it shows where the airflow uh, through uniformly ventilated alveoli with a nearly constant CO2 level. The highest level of the plateau is called the entitled CO2 and is recorded as such by the capno, uh, capnometer, capnometer. So you're gonna have an upswing and then a plateaus and then at the end of that plateau is your entitled CO2 and that is where your number is taken from. And then you start your downswing, which is where the CO2, uh, which is phase four, and that's the inspiratory phase. It's the sudden downstroke and ultimately returns to the baseline during inspiration. So, and that's where the respiratory pause restarts the cycle. And then you get back down to your baseline, restarting at phase one, and that is one cycle of the respiratory phase. At its most basic, the qualitative capnographer can be used to assess and correct initial periodic endotracheal uh, tube placements. Uh, continuous quantitative capnography may be used in innovative patients to confirm initial tube placement and to constantly monitor for tube misplacement. So in case you're moving your patient a lot, this will tell you whether your tube has dislodged or not pretty, in, uh, pretty instantaneously. The continuous waveform capnography may also be used to ensure proper exhaled CO2 levels for head trauma and stroke patients. 
Uh, continuous waveform cacnography also adds the ability to help troubleshoot hypoxemia and difficult ventilation and assess for bronchospasm, pulmonary embolus, and so on. The, con the continuous waveform cacnography also has the utility in monitoring non-intubated patients. Uh, by following trends in capnogram, uh, pre-hospital personnel, paramedics, EMTs can continuously monitor the patient's condition, detect trends, and document the response to medications. Several medical conditions and mechanical ventilation problems can be readily detected by capnography uh, compared to the normal capnogram. And these include uh, obstructive diseases. Obstructive pulmonary diseases such as asthma or uh, COPD obstruct air entry and alter the shape of the capnogram. Uh, these diseases give the typical shark, spin, uh, shark fin shape to the capnogram. So they kind of look like a shark fin that you would see sticking up out of the water, uh, like in Jaws or whatever. Rebreathing, uh, the rebreathing of gas can result in the failure of the capnogram to reach the baseline. Baseline should always be zero in a normal, healthy adult. The baseline should be zero. You should always, your end tidal CO2 or your waveform should always return to zero for, for phase one. Um, if we're rebreathing CO2, this won't happen. There will always be a end tidal measurement. This can be due to hyperventilation or problems in the breathing circuit. Uh, curare cleft appears when neuromuscular blockers begin to subside. So in an RSI or a uh, paralyzed patient, artificially paralyzed patient, um, when those meds start to wear off, you may see a cleft or a, a dip in the um, at the plateau towards the end tidal or towards the uh, end of the plateau. Uh, the depth of the cleft is inversely proportional to the degree of the drug activity. So the deeper the depth, the less the blocker is working. That makes more sense. Esophageal intubation uh, will show an absence of a waveform. You won't have anything. It won't move because it's not getting the entitled CO2. It's not getting any CO2. It's a sample, so it has no choice. The, the capnogram has no choice but to remain on zero. <clears throat> it may be a presence of a small disorganized waveform as indicative of uh, entitled CO2, uh, but it will not move. Uh, you should have some movement if you are, uh, if you're at, tube placement is um, correct. Uh, endotracheal tube or circuit leak waveforms uh, variations uh, are seen where there is a leak in the endotracheal tube cuff or the airway is too small for the patient. Um, those will generally look like they'll have variations in the waveform. You won't have the, the classic uh, up, plateau, down, uh, phases, uh, you may see more rounded, no plateaus because there's no, uh, the pressure is not maintaining uh, because of either the airway is too small and the pressures aren't reaching like they should be, or uh, the sampling is not uh, as accurate, or the uh, cuff is leaking or the vent circuit is leaking and allowing, uh, not allowing a full uh, breath measurement. The VQ mismatch uh, with, uh, as it occurs in the pulmonary embolism and similar conditions, the increase in dead space ventilations uh, causes a decrease in entitled CO2 levels throughout the entire uh, respiratory cycle. So if you have a VQ mismatch uh, or you're losing lung tissue due to a, a pulmonary embolism, atelectic uh, alveoli, or what have you, your total end tidal is going to start to drop because you're losing that area for gas exchange and so it's not happening anymore either the blood's not getting to it or the or the uh, air is not getting to it, oxygen is not getting to the alveoli and the co2 is not able to cross the barrier because there's nothing there to exchange with uh, an apnea uh, waveform 
will be uh, if it falls uh, to baseline. If there's if there's no movement, there's no uh, waveform at all. They're apneic, um, and you need to start bagging the patient. Hyperventilation leads to elimination of CO2 and progressively lowered exhaled CO2 levels. So a hyperventilation is going to start dropping your end tidal CO2 measurement. Uh, like I said, I've, I've demonstrated this in class before where I've hyperventilated myself uh, and dropped my end tidal CO2 down to 22. It was the lowest I've been able to get it. It took me about two to three hours to re uh, recover from that, and I don't, I strongly do not recommend it. Um, and then you, uh, and the flip side of that, uh, for hypoventilation, you'll see an increase in CO2 retention and progressive elevation of exhaled CO2 levels, so your waveform is going to become bigger and larger, and it's going to exceed the 35 to 45 range that we're, uh, that we're shooting for. Exhaled CO2 is useful in CPR. Um, during cardiac arrest, CO2 levels will fall. Uh, a lot following the onset of cardiac arrest, they begin to rise with the onset of effective CPR and return to near normal levels with the return of spontaneous circulations. So that tells you that if we're doing CPR on a patient and you're getting an entitled CO2 reading, at, say of 20, that you are doing CPR. And if you have a sudden return to the 35 to 45 range or a sudden increase, that is indication of a return of spontaneous circulation. Uh, it just shows you how much uh, difference there is between uh, manual compressions and the actual uh, heartbeat of our patient. Um, during effective CPR, uh, exhaled CO2 levels have been found to correlate well with cardiac output, coronary perfusion pressure, and even with the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of CPR uh, compressions. Continuous waveform technography is widely becoming the standard in EMS. Uh, misplaced CT tubes represent a significant area of liability in EMS, and the documentation provided by this technology can provide irrefutable evidence of proper endotracheal tube placement and recognition of displacement or, uh, or either way. Um, it is becoming the standard, and it's. Uh, I feel like it's not being widely used enough myself. But this is a personal. Uh, that's a personal thing. I think we should use it on anybody with respiratory distress uh, to give a good indicator of what's uh, of what's happening, and it may lead us and narrow down our differential diagnosis and guide our treatment better. Now we're going to discuss uh, peak end expiratory uh, flow here real quick. Um, well, here's our uh, uh, patient on the monitor. The life, you notice the life pack 15. He's got end tidal CO2. Uh, well, maybe that is just a regular nasal cannula. But our modern monitors, basically the, the point of this picture is to show that our monitors are showing, uh, if in the, especially in the uh, example of the life pack 15, you can monitor three EKG leads, uh, blood pressure, um, entitled CO2 uh, all at the same time. Uh, they, you can keep track of multiple, multiple uh, parameters of the patient uh, to get a good, solid look at what's going on with this, uh, with them to form your decisions. So here we're going to talk about the peak and expiratory uh, flow testing. Uh, it's a disposable plastic chamber, which the patient exhales forcefully after maximal inhalation. Um, they move little numbers and letters, and it spins a little propeller, and it gives you a reading. Um, they're very crude uh, measure of respiratory efficacy. Uh, they use them a lot in asthma and COPD to, to see a improvement or worsening of condition. Um, before and after uh, treatment. 
to kind of give them an idea of how well the, pa the patient is responding to treatments. Um, they are very, very, um, again, crude and uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to say they don't have a place in pre-hospital, but they are very uh, uh, cumbersome uh, at best. And our mandatory copyright. 